This morning, we're, we're glad you're here joining us, and we're glad that we're continuing our series called Investigating Jesus. And uh, last week, Pastor Brian encouraged us that we need to be good stewards with our worrying and how we should not worry. And last week, that message really touched me because I'm one of the biggest worry warts that there are, and so that was a challenge for me that I needed to hear that I should not worry. But this morning, we're going to look at this idea of ready or not. Now, how many hide-and-seek fans do we have in the house this morning? How many of you are out there? Now, I'm going to be honest. I used to love playing this as a kid, and in fact, I still would love it. If you all wanted to today to play hide-and-go-seek, I will come back to play hide-and-go-seek because it's awesome. It's my fa- one of my favorite games to play. But in that game, you have this idea where somebody is chosen as it, and you either do rock, paper, scissors, or maybe it's the one where they're just chosen by force. Everybody decides that Jimmy has to be the one that counts. And so they go and count to whatever astronomical number somebody chooses chooses, and then your goal as a person who's not it is to go and hide. And I used to always try to find the best hiding spot that nobody else could find. And so I would like climb to the top of a tree at the top like, ha, 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 I'm hiding, ha, ha, this is the best one. But then you always have those friends that they don't prepare. They're walking around, hey, hey Brad, what are you doing up there? I'm in a tree, get out of here. Like, what, what are you doing? Would you go hide? They're going to know I'm here. Get away. No, I... I'll be fine. I'm just going to stand around and hang out. And you have these friends that don't ever hide, and they think, you know what? I'll be able to run away at the last moment. I'll be able to escape. But what happens is, as soon as that person who's it gets done counting, they say the infamous line, ready or not, here I come. Right? And you're like, hoo, 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 hoo. But uh, for my friends, I never got to really do that because we would always play so far away that we actually didn't know when the person was coming. It was like, right, you count to a 1,000, then we're going to go run over here. And so we really had no clue when they were coming. But what ended up happening is those of us that were prepared, we could hide a lot longer than the person that was just walking around that didn't prepare. And they're like, ah, how come I always get tagged first? Well, you don't hide. You don't prepare, so that's the consequence. You don't prepare, then you're going to get tagged, and you're going to have to be it. Well, in the same way of hide-and-go-seek and and being ready or not, this passage that we're going to look at this morning actually talks about the fact that Jesus is going to return, and that nobody knows at what hour, not even Jesus knows, when he's going to come back and return to this earth. But we must be prepared for his return. Pastor Brian taught us last week about the kingdom of God, and he mentioned this idea that the kingdom is here, it's already here, but it's not yet consummated. Or in other words, it's here, but it's not yet completed. We're still waiting for the final return of Jesus Christ to come to make it complete. And so we're in a period of waiting. And what happened to the disciples, there's a cool story in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Don't turn there because we'll have it on the screen for you. But during this time, Jesus had, the disciples met with Jesus on top of the mountain. And they watched Jesus, their Savior, their Messiah, who just died and rose again, you know, came back from the dead. They're seeing him leave and go into heaven. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 that they're staring into heaven. I mean, a guy just floated away, their savior, the person they spent three years with, that they were learning what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus. He leaves, and they're left like this, just staring into the sky. And Acts 1.11 says this, two angels appeared to the disciples and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. See, the angels understood that the disciples were just standing there waiting for Jesus to come back. But the angels were telling them, look, there is work to be done. Don't just stand and wait for Christ to return. There is something that we must do until Jesus returns. He says, don't waste any more time looking in the sky. Go about kingdom work. In today's passage, Jesus is going to teach us what it means to be ready for his return. Because ready or not, he is coming back. If you would, I want you to turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 12. And we're going to look at verses 35 through 48. And um, this is one of the toughest passages I think I've Ever, no, it's not that I think. I know it's one of the toughest passages I've ever had to dive into and study and develop a message for. This had me working on it all week, last week. I, this is the toughest passage, but it's also the most convicting passage that I've had in my life. 
Because there are things that I found out from this passage that I had to check my life with, that I had to say, God, I need to change this in my life. It's challenging, it's tough, but it'll prepare us for Christ's return. In Luke chapter 12, verse 35, if you don't have your Bible, it'll be on the screen for you. It says this, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at the table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third watch and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what time, what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them the portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved the beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the privilege that we have to come together as a church family to worship you, to lift you up. But God, I pray that as we study your words this morning, Lord God, that you would speak to us in a new way, that you would challenge us, that you would change us, that you would bring healing to where we have hurts, that you would be re- bring restoration to where we've been torn down. It's in your name we pray, amen. Before we dig into this passage, I'm just going to set the scene. In chapter 12, we have this whole idea of chapter 12 is about stewardship. And in the beginning of the, chap- of the chapter, in verses 1 through 12, it talks about us being good stewards of the gospel, that we don't allow anybody to come in and teach a doctrine that is different to Jesus Christ crucified, risen again, and faith in him brings forgiveness of sins. And we have to be good stewards of that and fall after that teaching and chase after it. And we can't allow any anybody else to come in and do that. Then he goes on to the next section of verses, and he says, not only are we good stewards with the gospel, but we have to be good stewards with our possessions, our money, the resources that we have, because at the end of the day, it's all God's anyway. And so to be a faithful servant that chapter 12 is talking about is being a faithful steward in your possessions. And in today's passage, we're going to look at it that Not only do we have to be good stewards with our resources and the gospel, but God wants us to be faithful stewards with our time. Because we all have time on this earth. And what matters to Jesus and what matters before he returns is what are you doing, doing during the time that you are waiting for Jesus to return? I saw a cool illustration by Dr. Ed Stetzer, uh, And he gave a great illustration. And basically, this is it, that Jesus is coming. The disciples saw Jesus come the first time when he came as a man. And he died on the cross and rose again. And they heard that Jesus was telling them that he's going to return one day. And just like you have a two-volume book here where this is John Calvin's commentary on Isaiah. It's two volumes. And so the whole complete volume is these two books. See, what the disciples thought is that Jesus' coming was going to be just like this that he's gonna come and then he's gonna return right away. Well, what we've seen for the last 2,000 plus years is that Jesus' coming was not this close. It was actually, he came here and it's more over here. And what Jesus says is this time in between is our lifespan. 
that we live on the earth. And this is the waiting period between his first coming and his second coming. And people can get caught up in when and where and how, and they'll get out a lot of cool things they could show you in visuals, but we're not going to get into that this morning. What we're going to talk about is the fact that Jesus is coming back, and what matters is how you prepare during your time of waiting, because it matters. It matters to us. There's a few principles that Jesus teaches in this passage. We're going to look at three principles in this passage. The first one is this, is that a good steward will be spiritually ready. In verses 35 through 36, and we're going to look at verse 42 as well, it says this, Stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. And verse 42 says this, gives a further explanation. It says, And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Jesus gives three pictures or symbols of being ready. The first is saying, it says, stay dressed for action. And if you actually look at what the Greek word is behind that, it actually means gird up your loins. And when I think of loins, I'm thinking of pork loins. And so I had to look at it and say, okay, I know it's not gird your pork loins, that would be weird. So I looked at it, and it's basically what happened is you have to remember that during this time, they wore robes, and it's hard to run around in a robe. I think I've, over this week, I've pictured myself trying to run in a robe, like, kind of like this. And so I wasn't going to actually wear a robe to do it because it would be bad. But I'm thinking that it's hard to work and to do things quickly and rapidly if your legs are tied up. And so what they would actually do to gird your loins is they would take the bottom of the robe and they would stick it under their belt. So that now they have the freedom to move their legs, that they can serve, they can work, and they can move around rapidly. So Jesus is saying here, stay dressed so that you can always work, that you can always serve, that you can always be faithful. Then he talks about lamps being burnt. Keep your lamps burning. See, back then they don't have electricity. They can't do the clap on, clap off. They don't have Motel 6 to leave the light on for you. They had to actually light lamps. And what happened is, when the master went away, they would need to keep these lamps burning because they didn't know when the master was returning. So they would have to trim the wicks. They'd have to keep lighting it. They'd have to make sure there was enough oil in the lamps. That way, when the master returned, the lamps were burning. And so there's this idea of constantly preparing. Notice it's not just prepare one day. It's not just prepare one moment. It's constantly preparing. He gives the other imagery where he says, the master went away to a wedding feast. Now, during this time, the master would leave, and he would leave one servant in charge of the rest of his house to make sure that people had their food, that they were feeding, treating the other servants the right way, but also keeping the house in order. Well, in the, with these wedding feasts, is they could last anywhere from four to seven days. And what happened is we didn't have text message, didn't have a cell phone, we couldn't phone a friend. Like, you didn't know when the wedding was over. It could be anywhere between four and seven days, and you didn't know when he was coming back. And the Bible even mentions that he could come back on the second watch or the third watch. Second watch just means he could come from 9 to midnight. He could come from midnight to 3 a.m. You don't know when the master was going to return, so you always had to have that house in order and house ready. And this is the imagery that, uh, that Jesus uses to teach us about being ready. And the same way, spiritually, if we flip it, and spiritually, we need to be alert at all times. We need to be focused at all times. We need to be ready when Christ returns. So how do we prepare ourselves spiritually? If you would, you can kind of make a jump in your book. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Because 1 Peter talks about the end times in chapter 4. And he talks about how the day is approaching, the end of time, where Jesus is going to return. And he gives us three principles from this chapter that helps us prepare spiritually. Because if Jesus returns and expects us to be prepared, we need to know how we ourselves need to prepare. Look at uh, 1 Peter 4, verse 7. It says this, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. In your notes, I put it this way. I said it as maintain self-control. 
Now we can say self-control in some, easy, some, some kind of simple terms where it's, okay, I'm gonna stay away from bad words, I'm gonna kinda temper my, I'm gonna kinda control my anger, I'm not gonna get into drugs, I'm not gonna get into this alcohol, so I'm gonna kinda temper those things. But I think Paul means it on a much deeper spiritual level than just saying, oh, just, don't, just focus on the things you shouldn't do. I think Paul, the focus is we need to have self-control in the areas of things that we should do. Because I don't know about you, whenever I focus on things that I shouldn't do, that's when I begin to fall into it. In times when I say, okay, I hope I don't get an attitude with somebody today. Man, I hope I have a, those are the moments that I have a bad attitude because I'm already thinking about it. And so what Paul, Peter is saying here is that, look, we need to focus on the things that we should do. And I, and I think it pertains more to what Peter's saying is we need to focus on our spiritual disciplines. You see, it's easy for us to get sidetracked and say, you know what? I'm not going to spend time, I'm not going to have self-control in reading my Bible. I'm not going to have self-control and spend time in prayer with God. I'm going to lose control in that area. I'm going to lose control in being able to serve and to love other people. And what happens is we lose self-control in our spiritual disciplines, and then before we know it, we've walked away from God, and our life is now being lived unprepared. How do we go about that? Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 9, 25 through 27. He says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it other, under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Here's how I found an easy way to put spiritual disciplines into my life. I had to have a plan for reading my Bible. I had to have people that can hold me accountable. Question, do you have people to hold you accountable for reading God's word? Do you have people to hold you accountable? Hey man, are you praying? You know, is there anything that I can pray for you about? It's joining a life group so that people can pour into you, that they can invest in you. You see, when you begin to put these spiritual disciplines and have a plan for it, it helps you to have self control. And then what you'll begin to notice as you focus on God's word, as you focus on the Holy Spirit, as you focus on your relationship with Jesus, all the things you shouldn't do, you're no longer doing and all the things you should do, you find yourself doing. The hardest thing for any of us in here is to have discipline in our life. We are the hardest people to discipline. But Peter says if you want to maintain self-control, it takes discipline. Just like an athlete, he gives an, an imagery of the athlete. An athlete is going to train their whole life. If it's basketball, they're going to sacrifice. They're going to make time. When everybody else is at home sleeping, watching TV, they're training. They're working because they're chasing after a goal. It should be the same thing in our spiritual life because our spiritual life matters more than a game of basketball. And so we need to find that accountability to have self-control in our life. Man, find that time to pray. Lift your struggles up to God. Lift your pain, your fears. Whatever it is, have that moment with God. Verse eight and nine give us the next thing that Peter says if we want to be spiritually prepared. He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Being ready for Christ means that we're loving others. When he mentions above all, it's not just, okay, do this after you feel like it. No, he's saying above all, anything else that you do, love other people. He doesn't say love it when you feel like it. He doesn't say love people sometimes. He doesn't say love people when they give you something. He says love them at all times. Love them first. 1 John 4, 7 says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. God's children love other people. But I think Peter actually takes it a step further because it's easy for us to just love anybody that we, are, that we like or that hasn't harmed us or hurt us. The latter part of, of verse eight says this, love covers a multitude of sins. And so I did some research on that because I'm like, what does that mean? What is Peter actually talking about that? 
You see, this is what I believe is what I've found is that Peter understands that all of us as Christians, we're ultimately sinners that make mistakes that mess up. That all of us at some point in time are going to mess up and somebody else is going to see it. Whether we offend somebody or we're caught in pornography and somebody finds out, whatever it is, we all make mistakes. And what Peter is saying is that love covers a multitude of sins. And that we as Christians, when we love others, we don't condemn, we don't judge, we love those brothers and sisters. See, it's very easy for us, it's always easy for us to be harsher with somebody's sins than our own. It's always easy for us to just, I can't believe you did that. See, that's the attitude we get, and Paul, Peter says, no, 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 that's not the attitude you have. You give him love, the same love that God has shown you. God didn't shake his finger at you and say, I can't believe you did that, I'm cutting you off. Jesus said, despite what you did, I'm coming to the cross. And God says, have the same love to others in that way. You see, I had people that made a big difference in my life. And the people that made the biggest difference in my life weren't the ones that when I messed up said, ha ha, told you so, get out of here. Those never made an impact in my life. The ones that made the biggest difference were the friends that when I told them my struggles that I dealt with, that they cared for me, that they loved me, and held me accountable. I had a friend of mine that uh, when I was going through a period where I was smoking and drinking and other things and I was really struggling with it and I, and I told him about it, he didn't sit there and judge me for it. He said, well, you know what, I'm gonna do whatever I can to help you. He said, any moment that you feel tempted to do that sin, call me. And so there were times it was two o'clock in the morning, I would call him and I'd say, bro, I am struggling with this. Not one time, did he judge me? Not one time did he go and gossip about all my garbage. All he did was show me love and say, I'm here to pray for you and to help you. And what happened in my life is I was able to achieve victory over that because somebody was loving me without judging me. And God says the same thing in your life. If there's grudges you're holding on to, let them go. If there's unforgiveness in your heart, forgive. Because God's forgiven us for so much. Third thing that Paul teaches in this passage is this. Use gifts to serve others. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each has received a gift, talking about believers, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. If we're going to be ready for Christ's return, we have to use our gifts as good stewards. The Bible tells us that each of us have been given a gift. It's not a maybe. It's not, you know, oh, I don't have any gifts. No, you were given a gift. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, it says this. All these gifts are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions or gives to each one individually as he wills. So the moment that you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you were given a spiritual gift that you are to use for God's kingdom, that you're used, for you to use here at Hollywood Community Church, that all the members work together to build each other up. And the gifts that you have, we need them. Because without your gifts, the church body suffers. Now you can look in Romans, you can look in Romans, 1 Corinthians, and you can find different gifts, and I'll name some. There's teaching, there's preaching, there's leadership, there's administration, and those, there's wisdom, discernment, be able to tell the difference between right and wrong, and just having wisdom that other people don't have. It's even great faith. You ever met somebody who just has huge faith where God's gonna give me this building, and they pray, and God gives them the building. And it's like, I'm gonna pray for a shoe, and I don't get a shoe. There's just people that have different gifts, that I do, and great faith is one of them. And what, Paul's, what Paul says is we need to use all those gifts to build up this body, and especially here in Hollywood, we need your gifts. Because you see, God didn't give us gifts to sit on them. He gave us gifts to serve and to love. You see, when I began serving, I didn't know what gifts I had, and I don't know if anybody else in here is like, well, if God gave me a gift, I don't know what it is. Well, guess what? There's hope, because I didn't know gifts that I had in my life, and so I remember a guy, Rob McKinney, who spoke a couple weeks ago at Anniversary Weekend, he said, hey, do you want to come be a part of my children's ministry? And I was like, ugh, that means snot and boogers, and I don't know if I want to do that. But I was like, you know what, God, if you want me to do that, I'll do it. And then there was one time, Rob comes up to me, and he says, Brad, I'm going to need you to wear these Superman tights for this skit. What? I'm like, 
do you see my legs? They're like chickens, all right? I don't think it's good. And I remember saying, God, are you sure you want me to put on Superman tights? I'm sure that's sinful in some way, God, and I'm trying to get out of it. But I'm like, all right, God, if, if you're going to have me do it. But when I went and did that stuff, I began to find out that God had given me a gift to work with children and to just be silly in front of people and to have this natural gift that I would have never found if I wouldn't have even taken those silly opportunities, God revealed gifts and talents in my life that I didn't know I had. And so if you don't know what your gift and talent is, here's what I would encourage you to do. Start serving, pick a ministry, women's, men's, parking lot, first impressions, you know, whatever it is, start serving and see the gifts and talents that God will reveal to you. Because here's what I know. When I became involved in ministry and I began to use the gifts and talents that God's given me, Your gift and talent, check this out, your gift and talent is connected to your passion. I'm gonna say that again. Your gift and talent is connected to your passion. So when you use your gifts, you are passionate about it, and when you're passionate about it, you will love to do it, whether you get paid or not, and even if you're not getting paid, you will do it for free because it's your passion. And what happens is when you begin to use your gifts and talents for God's work, and you begin to see lives change because God's using you as his instrument, that is life-changing. I got started in children's ministry in 2002, and I have not been out of ministry since. Why? Because God has used my gifts, connected with my passion, to fuel me for what I'm doing now today. And God wants to do the same thing in your life, is to connect your gifting and passion together so that you're serving his kingdom and seeing other people come to Christ. You are valuable to God and you're valuable here at Hollywood Community Church. If we maintain self-control, love others above all, and use our gifts to serve others, we'll be prepared for Christ's return. We're gonna look at the motivation of why we should be ready. How many of you guys are watching the Olympics? Wow, that's more than I thought. I'm not watching at all. The only time I was telling John, the only time I'm catching it is when it comes on Sports Center, and that's the only time I see it. Not a big fan of Winter Olympics, but you know, what motivates these athletes to train and to put their body through all kinds of this rigorous training? What what makes them do that? What's the motivation behind it? And I, I was thinking about the skiers those people that do those crazy skiing. I mean, I started thinking about it. What, who was the first person that said, hey, I got these jumbo popsicle sticks. I'm gonna stand on them, and I'm gonna tie them to my feet, and I got these canes, and I'm just gonna go through the snow? <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, you're crazy. Like, I would never do that. And these skiers, they jump on these popsicle sticks, and they fly down the mountain, and my favorite part is watching the highlights when they all wipe out because it's amazing. I don't like when they get hurt, but it's funny just to watch some of them tumble. And when I think about it, I'm like, man, these skiers are willing to stand on a mountain, fly down, train all this time, risk injury, risk, you know, you know losing their careers because of a bad injury, and they do it all for one thing. They do it all for one gold medal. Now, not to demean that, that gold medal is awesome. That means that you beat everybody in the world that's the best of the best, and that's awesome. But they're doing it for a little medal. They're doing it for a reward. Jesus says, second thing in your notes, Jesus will reward the faithful steward. That if we prepare faithfully now, There's a reward for us, and rewards are not bad. When I was a teacher, I would reward kids for bad behavior. Uh, Wait, that was wrong. Maybe that's why I wasn't a good teacher. (laughs) Maybe that's why I'm no longer a teacher. All right. Detention's for everyone. This is great. Uh, Terrible. That's not what I meant to say. Um, I would reward kids for good behavior, right? And what they tell you as a teacher is that it's always better to focus on positive reinforcement instead of negative reinforcement. And so Jesus tells us, look, you know, if you are faithful, there's going to be a reward. And there's two cool rewards that I came across in this passage that, that just blow me away. And uh, I want you to look at verse 37 and 38. He says this, Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third watch and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. Jump down to verse 43. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, 
he will set him over all his possessions. Three times Jesus in in those few short verses says, blessed is that servant who is faithful. Blessed is that servant who is ready. Blessed is that servant who is prepared. And so if Jesus is saying this and repeating it, it's important. Jesus is saying, look, check this out, listen up. If you don't catch anything else, check this. I will reward you for being faithful. That all that effort that you put to sacrifice and to put spiritual disciplines will end in a reward. So what is that reward? What will Jesus reward us with? Look at verse 37 again. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at the table and he will come and serve this. Check this out. This is what Jesus is saying. If you prepare now and you're living for him, he will come and invite you to sit at his table. He will ready himself for action and he will serve you. Jesus was always about serving. And he says, your reward is for me to serve you. We might want to think, okay, well, that's awesome, you know, but I want you to catch the idea behind it. When you eat at a table, there is intimacy and there is fellowship. Our first reward is fellowship with Jesus. Jesus will serve you at his table. And I want you to imagine this, church. I want you to imagine sitting at Jesus' table At his table, there will be no crying. At Jesus' table, there will be no pain. At Jesus' table, there will be no worry. At Jesus' table, there will be no more addictions. At Jesus' table, there will be no hunger. At his table, there will be no lonely people. But at his table, there will be peace. At his table, there will be joy. At his table will be rest. At his table will be fulfillment. At his table will be ultimate satisfaction. At his table will be love. At his table will be Jesus, our Savior, our King, our Redeemer. What better reward is it than to sit at Jesus' table? We're going to have fellowship with Jesus as our first reward. But here's the second thing. If you're faithful if you're responsible with what God has given you, he says this, you will be rulers in God's kingdom. Jesus says that if we are faithful in service in this life, that he will give us greater responsibility in heaven and in the coming kingdom. Even though we may not know exactly what that looks like, it's gonna be an awesome privilege to be put in charge in God's kingdom. I had a second grade teacher, Mrs. Whaley, and that's a weird name, I always thought it was weird and I still laugh at that name to this day. Man, her name was Mrs. Whaley, but she had this awesome thing that she had for her class. She would say the person, a student that showed best behavior in work and in behavior would get to be teacher for the day. Now, I was saying, like, I wanted that. That means you got to do flashcards. You got to do, you know, the spelling test. I mean, you were the teacher for the day. And I'm like, I want to be teacher of the day. I never got that sucker, but I wanted it. And so... I was like, man, I want to be the teacher. How awesome would that be? I get to stand in front of the class and say, spell supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, what? And the kids are like, oh, snapper. <laughs> so, uh, so I wanted that, and it was an ultimate thing. But here's the point behind it is that the teacher was still ultimately in charge. She could take away my power at any moment, right? She was still in charge, but what she did is allowed these students to have responsibility, to have rule in that classroom. And I never forgot that because I'm like, wow, a teacher that allows us to share in her responsibility of ruling. Jesus says the same thing, that we are in some way in the coming kingdom going to have responsibility to rule in his kingdom. We may not know what it is, but if we work hard, stay ready, put in the effort to receive the blessing of fellowship at Jesus' table, we'll have a part in ruling in his kingdom. Here's the third thing that I have in my notes that Jesus teaches us in Luke chapter 12. Jesus warns the faithful steward about spiritual laziness. Now this this point took a while to get to. We had to look at verses 38, I mean 39 and 40, and then all the way from 41 to 48. I think I've read that passage 1,000 times. But in trying to get at what the point really means. And if you look at the parable in verses 39 through 40, you see that he starts this parable about how uh, that Jesus is now a thief, and not a thief in the sense of his character and lying and stealing, but he's a thief in the fact that he's going to come unexpected. And he says, if the homeowner knew that a thief was coming 
and knew what time the thief was coming, he wouldn't leave his house and let it get broken into. He would be sitting in his house prepared. And back then during this time, they didn't have concrete walls like we have. They didn't have electric saws to get in your house. But what happened is their houses were mostly made out of mud and that thieves could just start digging in your house in the mud. So it wasn't that you just had to watch your front door or your windows. You had to watch your whole entire house because a thief could just dig inside your house, crawl through, and take your stuff. And so Jesus said, look, if a man knew that this thief was coming, he'd sit there and watch every corner and crack in his house, watching for this thief. And then he tells us to be ready. And and, and Peter asks this question in verse 41. He says, Peter, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? Peter asked that question because he, he understood something that, Peter, that Jesus was implying. Jesus was implying we can never be prepared enough. In your notes, you can write that down, is we never be prepared enough. You might say, well, Brad, where do you get that from in these passages? When he mentions in 39 and 40, he says this in verse 40, you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. First, Jesus is telling us, be ready because Jesus is going to come back and you want to make sure you're ready. But then he tells you, even if you're prepared, you're still not going to expect when he's coming. And you might get confused and say, well, what does that mean? What, how do, Jesus, what are you saying? What it means is that we are never going to get to the place in our lives where we have arrived at being faithful. We will never get to the place where we can say, okay, I'm good. I don't have to prepare anything else. I've learned all the knowledge I have. I don't need to do anything else in my, in, in my life. You see, that's why Peter, I believe Peter got a little offended because Jesus is implying, look, disciples, you are not going to be prepared. You're not going to be prepared enough. And Peter says, whoa, hold on, Jesus. Are you talking to us, your disciples that have hung out with you for the last three years? You know us. You know that we're faithful to you. Aren't you talking to those other people that are the crowds listening over there? Because I know you're not telling us we need to be prepared more because we're eventually, we're, and Jesus says, no, no, no. You will never be prepared enough. But Jesus doesn't answer Peter's question directly. He never gives the pleader a flat-out answer and says, okay, This is the answer. Instead, he gives him another parable in verses 42 through 48. And I kind of liken it like this. If if any of you have ever tried to teach somebody something, there may be a way that you say it the first time, and you're like, all right, they're going to get it. But you look at them, and they have this look on their face like, I don't get what you're saying. And so you explain it again in a different way, and you kind of add more details to what you're talking about. This is what Jesus does with these two parables, the one about the thief and this one in 42 and 48 with about the faithful servant. He says, okay, I'm going to explain it again, but I'm going to add more details for you. Look at what he says in verse 45. He says, but if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. In your notes, I said it this way. We must resist the temptation to slack off. You see, Peter, Jesus knew that each of us, even the disciples, were going to be tempted to slack off. Because Jesus hasn't come back, right? 2,000 plus years, he hasn't returned. There's a story about this pastor. He used to walk into a group of pastors into a room, and he would say, is Jesus returning today? And all the pastors would say, no. And the pastor would tell them, then you are not prepared. Because see, what happens is Jesus doesn't come back. He didn't come back last week. He hasn't come back yet. And so our tendency is to think, well, you know what? I have time to do what I want. I have time to chase my dreams. I have time to do what I want to do with my body. I have time that, and I have enough time that I can get ready before Jesus comes back. The sad truth is that time is not on our side. At any moment, our life could end, and we're standing face to face with Jesus Christ. And you lose that opportunity to prepare. You see, our natural inclination inclination is, like Jesus said, is to, to think, oh, master's delayed, let me do my thing. And so he tells Peter, no, you have to prepare. You have to resist slacking off. Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says, well, how can we avoid slacking off? 
This is what the writer of Hebrews says. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but of encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. How you stay ready and avoid slacking off is coming here with the fellowship of our church family. And it says spurring, stirring up one another, which means motivating another one. You were created to do good works. Continue to do those good works. And you come along somebody, hey, man, come with me. We're going to serve God today. We're going to do this outreach. We're going to hang out here. We're going to do this. How can we do what we do better? And it even goes further and says, as the day gets closer to Christ's return, do that even more. So even when you think you've done it enough, you need to keep doing it even more. And so the same challenge is for us. How do we stay motivated? Get around other believers that are motivated. If you find that you're around yourself with people that are unmotivated, you might need to switch to a group of people that are spiritually motivated so that you can be prepared. Because at the end of the day, Jesus is, you're going to stand before Jesus, and it's going to be you either prepared or you didn't. It wasn't, oh, I wanted to, Jesus. Jesus is not going to worry about, I wanted to. He's going to look at what you did. So if other people are pulling you down and not motivating you, Switch to new ones that are going to spur you on, that are going to make you love the things of God. We'll close with this. Jesus provides a daily test for us to determine if we are a faithful steward. I want you to look with me in verse 47 and 48. It says, And that servant who knew his master's will, but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given... Of him much will be required, and from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Jesus gives us a simple test, and you can get into the beating. There's many debates on, is this unfaithful steward? Is that a believer or not a believer? And you can, there's good merit in figuring that out, but the real point that Jesus is making is, look, I've given you a daily test in your life to determine if you're spiritually prepared or not. Look at the verses in 42 through 48 and look at your life and where you are now and say, is my life a life of a faithful servant or is it a life of an unfaithful servant? And so 47 through 48, it's a daily reminder. Jesus isn't saying, I'm going to give this to you so you can point out who is good. No, he's saying for you personally, every day, take this passage out and say, am I being faithful or unfaithful? If you find yourself being unfaithful, there is time right now to say, God, change those areas. Forgive me those areas where I've been unfaithful and give it to God and strive and make a commitment to live for him. Use this as a test to make sure that you're living a life that is prepared for Jesus when he returns. There's a story that I'll close with. It was called The New England Dark Day. You can look it up online. But back in May 19, 1780, there was a fire that breached out in Canada. And all this smoke and soot made its way into the New England area. And in Connecticut, they woke up that day to a red sun. They woke up to dark skies, and everybody began to panic like, this is the day of judgment. Jesus is returning. And there happened to be a legislative meeting going on in Connecticut, and the people that were there for that legislation meeting, they were panicked. They were like, grab the lamps, light the candles, and they called everybody into a room, and they're like, the end is near, and what what are we going to do? And they began to panic, and they remembered that this guy, Adam Davenport, was a Christian, and they called him in, and they said, look, Adam, I think we just need... the." Is this the day of judgment? If it is, can we just go home to be with our wives, our family, and our friends and just wait till Jesus returns? Adam Davenport said this, this well may be the day of judgment which the world awaits, but be it so or not, I only know my present duty and my Lord's command to occupy till he come. So at the post where he has set me in his providence, I choose for one to meet him face to face. No faithless servant frightened from my task, but ready when the Lord of the harvest calls. And therefore, with all reverence, I would say, let God do his work. We will see to ours. Bring in the candles. What does Adam say? There is work to be done up until the point of Jesus' return. Even if you think Jesus is returning today, it is not a chance to slack off. In fact, it's to continue and do it even more the work that God has called you to do. 